Martin Rehák. Welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. You tweeted in December 2018, AI is simply a technology. As with any technology, humans shall be accountable for its use and misuse. History taught us that as with any technology, we need to learn how to master and, if necessary, regulate it. Where are we right now? Did we master it? Do we need to regulate it? So we are very much at the beginning of the AI. As Anita said in the morning, it's six years in. And we will need more than that to get to the depth of it. I think we will very soon start saying that AI doesn't work, is broken, or simply we will get disillusioned, according to the Gartner curve. My job now is to get us over that curve and get us to the real actual use of AI that's safe, secure, and helps everyone on the planet. The speed of crime, AI, fintech, and adversarial innovation. Topic for Martin Rehak. Thank you. So I will start in the history. I will start in the 70s, when the US Army just left Vietnam. And they just lost a war, which is a very painful experience for anyone especially for the army. And they were thinking, how do we avoid losing the next war with the Soviet Union, which was very much on the agenda at that time. So one of the key thinkers in that area was Colonel John Boyd from the US Air Force. And he came up with a very simple idea. What is it, war? How do you fight? He was a fighter pilot. He fought in planes, and he fought over Vietnam. And he decided that the best way how to think about a fight is in terms of OODA loop. Observe, orient, decide, act. And over and over again, you do this on one side, the enemy does this on the other side, and at the end, the one of you will win, and the other will perish. The concept got quite influential. It pushed military thinking from very old, saying that the biggest army always wins, into a modern era. And it introduced a concept of getting inside the OODA loop. So the technology development afterwards was driven by the need to get inside the Soviet Union's army, OODA loop. How can I react faster? How can I be more precise? How can I hit and disappear before anyone can counter me? So technologies like GPS, sensors and guidance, many, lots of the physics and microelectronics that we use today, many of the precision targeting technologies or communication systems are driven by the investment into tighter and better OODA loop, into getting faster and getting smarter. It's typically manifested as one missile to one kill ratio, which is a huge innovation because before that, it was like 70,000 projectiles for one enemy casualty. So this is the outcome. You all, most of you have seen these pictures in the Iraqi war. And you see what happens when you lose and when someone gets inside your OODA loop. When someone innovates faster than you do, can hit harder and faster, and the battle is over before you It's a big issue, and it can arrive to anyone. In management speak, we always, or we likely call it disruptive innovation, a term coined by Clayton Christiansen in the similar time. And it's coming to AI and fintech. What we can see is a timeline. But you can see it's slightly skewed. We are in the organization that cares about exponentials. I decided to be contrarian, so this is a logarithmic X, where you see ratios. And you see that if you care about time and you care about time ratios, the speed up you get going from one year to one hour is almost the same as the one you need to get from one hour to one second. So if you want to get really fast, it took humans a couple of centuries to get from year-long finance, 
finance delays to one day operations of current financial systems, where most things get settled overnight. It will take the same effort, and it takes the same effort to go down to the one second level, which is where no longer communication can help. It's all about automation. Humans can no longer play in one second time intervals. So if you want to get faster, you need to get automated. You need to get human out of the loop, and you need to get inside the compo oppositions of ODA. What does it look like for finance? There are three main trends we can think about. First of them is convenience. As a customer, you want immediate decision anytime, any place you want. You don't want to go to a bank, you don't want to talk to a person, you don't want to wait in a line. That's impossible to imagine today. AI can also help you to drive better decisions and drive competition. If you are an insurance company and you reason about individual and not about statistics, you can handpick, cherry pick the individuals that are the most profitable ones and you can offer them a huge discount and still make money. So that's an easy way how to use technology advantage to increase the profits. And because you have better technology and you have a way how to tailor your reasoning about risk and benefit to an individual level, you can actually get to the point where you open a new market and the finance gets much more democratized. Alex said that lots of the most people in the world don't have access to financial services we have here. Bitcoin and blockchain may be one way how to change that, but simply deploying standard financial institutions is another way how to close the gap. So getting immediate convenience is a good way. You can ask, does it matter? Do people really care about taking a loan in one second? Do they care about convenience so much? Well, the examples are easy. These are just four of the hundreds of companies working in the fintech era. So Affirm is the equivalent of the Czech Twisto that many of you know and use, and they do point-of-sale instant lending. Their volume of transactions was two billion in 2018, with 100% year-over-year growth. So a small company so far, but growing super quickly. Cabbage, small business lending, six billions in loans extended. Forter, AI-based detection of fraud in car transactions, 100 billions of transactions checked. And Revolut, next generation bank, they don't even have a branch in Czech Republic and they have 50,000 customers or so in this country. So this is the way how AI helps to address much bigger market at much lower cost and multiply the effects of the people you have on the team. So what is it AI? In my interpretation, AI is very simple. It's a simple way how to replace bureaucracies. So what used to be done by process, paperwork, management, and people managing people so that they behave like cocks in the wheel and in a complex machine, you can now achieve using automation. And when we speak about finance, you can make two kinds of mistakes. You can make a decision that's too conservative, so you don't extend the loan to someone you should have to, or on the other side, you extend the loan to a criminal, or you let a transaction pass that you should have blocked. Both cases cost you money, different amounts, but eventually they can cost you out of the existence. We know that in South California, the banks that can extend loans to immigrants make much more money because immigrants don't have so much choice on the market and the margins are significantly higher. So what is preventing us from adopting AI widespread? Simply, we don't know enough about it yet. What we don't know is how can you manipulate the decision? Most of you, or many of you, work in the financial sector. You can guess how would you steal money from a bank in one way or the other. 
how can you steal money from the bank that has been completely automated, where no humans, no people are actually working for you? And you are facing a simply an AI model behind an application in your smartphone. There are three main ways how to do that. First one is called confidentiality attacks. So you work with the bank model, you ask different questions, you try to get loans so that you can learn how does it decide and how does it work. So essentially, if you are a competitor, you can steal your, the know-how of your opposition, of your competition on the market. <coughs> you can also steal the information about the customers. If the model is badly trained, you can learn who got a loan, for how much, and where does he live by asking smart questions. Evasion is much worse, because at that point, you actually lose money. It means that someone has found a mistake in the AI model. Someone has found a gap. A because you didn't have enough data, or you didn't train your model well enough, and someone finds a way how to get a loan they shouldn't have gotten, or someone finds a way how to pass a transaction through the sanctioned regime, and you get a huge fine by the regulator for that. Poisoning is even worse. Someone is consistently doing business with you, respecting all the obligations, being a nice guy, so that he trains your AI to trust him and to trust what he does so that he can get ready for the big hit, which costs you money. So all of these are just categories, and each of them has many kinds of attacks you can deploy against AI. So you say, I will stay safe. I will not use AI in my bank or my company, and I will be safe from all this nonsense. Well, not so much. Because I can use AI to train attackers. There is a technique called generative adversarial networks that is capable of creating attacks on the AI or on humans or on traditional systems. So these pictures were not drawn by any human. These were generated by GANs, as we call them, in 2016. And you can see that they are kind of strange, but you wouldn't distinguish them from human artifacts on the first sight. So how do they come to being? It's a very simple game between two entities. One of them is called generator, top left corner. This entity creates those pictures and submits them for assessment by the other entity called discriminator. In this case, we randomly generate pictures of animals or fluffy things that should look like cats. And or we generate something that looks like money. Discriminator is trained to tell apart actual cats or actual money from the fake ones. And as a generator, I have an access to the output. I can see where did I make mistake, I can learn from my mistake, and I can fix it. So AI works with the experience, and if you let two AI algorithms work against each other, they can actually improve mutually. So after a couple of years, and just two years, these are the pictures of the people who do not exist. And you can actually generate them on a page that's called, this person doesn't exist. These people were completely generated by the GANs based on the database of pictures that's taken from Facebook and other sources. And they can, with these pictures, pass some of the KYC requirements in some of the countries in the world. So you can use them to create fake identities and onboard people. Still, you can see that some of them are not quite natural. They are not perfect, but they are good enough. It's not everything. How many of you does have a phone with fingerprint sensor to unlock? OK, so don't trust it. <laughs> because uh, last November, a group of researchers designed and used AI and GANs and combination of other techniques to build what's called universal master print. So those four prints that you can see up there are generated. They don't belong to any living human. They are just pictures that were trained on locks of the phones and databases so that they can unlock 80% of the phones out there. And you don't need anything else. So keeping your confidential data on a phone that's secured by a fingerprint may not be the best idea ever. 
And this is just the beginning. GANs are effectively less than three years old from the first beginning, and it's only starting. So you can say criminals will never do that. Only strange, smart, weird people like the guy on the podium will do that. Well, think again. This is the UK crime statistics. And since 2015, majority of all the crime in the UK has been online. Offline crime, physical robberies, stealing in shops and so on, is a minority now. Majority of that online part is fraud in the financial system in one way or the other. So if you think about crime and criminals, stop thinking about someone mugging you in the street. It's not useful anymore. No one does that anymore. Think about someone stealing your credit card, someone else stealing money from the account, and someone else walking away with the goods. This happened to Apple. They launched Apple Pay in US in 2014. And it's arguably one of the most secure payment systems out there, based on the strength of the hardware, strength of the onboarding and software on the device. Still, the level of the fraud was horrible. And at some point, employees in gaming shops were joking that if someone walks in, buys a PlayStation, and pays with the Apple Pay, it's 100% fraud, and it almost always was. The reason was that <coughs> the Apple didn't have a choice. They had to get people on the platform. They had to onboard them, and they had to work with banks to get them onboarded. And each bank had a different onboarding process to get the card of client of the bank loaded into Apple Pay. And some of them had a very weak process, where you could talk your way <coughs> through the call center. So when your card was stolen, and all of them are, so the number was on the internet, someone just bought it for a couple of cents, tried onboarding, and then gave it to someone with a phone, say, go buy a PlayStation, sell it on the black market, bring me $200. And that's how criminals are able to exploit the fissures between the old and the new. And this is not a single process. Essentially, for every single security-relevant process in the bank right now, or just some of them, you can find a way how to attack it with the AI or how to address it with the AI. So KYC onboarding, you can use GANs to generate photos and videos. So if you think that the onboarding with Skype call is safe, not always. Authentication, fingerprints, biometry, all of that can be faked by the AI as an attacker quite easily. Consumer credit, how do you need to ask for the credit and what do you, how do you need to fill in your application or which transactions do you have to fake in your PSD2 accessible account to get the best credit at the best conditions? And fraud detection, that's also the same case. AML, anti-money laundering, again. All of these should be and are easily fooled by the AI if they are automated. So what is the dilemma? It looks like we have two choices. If I were in traditional bank, I would say, if I don't use AI, first, I will get attacked by the criminals, and second, I will get beaten by the competitors. If I use AI, I will get beaten by the criminals. Doesn't look like a good outline. So there is two ways how to look into that. Two ways how to solve this. First, simplicity. And this is why FinTech moves so fast, because they don't have the legacy business. A legacy business makes you slow. The need to serve the existing old customers, traditional customers, and to re respond to every need they voice is slowing you down. So if you reduce the options, remove fallbacks, break legacy compatibility, all of that will increase your velocity and reduce your attack surface, so you get much safer, much cheaper. But you lose business. It's a hard decision to make. Or you can go into the escalation war. You can speed up the security development. You can use AI to build very secure models, 
And you can use constant security testing and monitoring so that you actually understand the AI you are using. And you can use it as an advantage in competition so that you will be the one who will survive in the very tough market ahead. So any good news? I think so. So first, I agree with Anita that AI itself does not discriminate. If it does, it's the fault of the humans who trained it, who biased it, and who made it wrong. You can impose a wrong model on the AI, wrong features, or wrong biased training data, and you can replicate the errors of the humanity or the bureaucracy, but you will never get worse than bureaucracy. But the big advantage is that the pie gets significantly bigger. Using AI, you can address and you can extend the services to the customers much faster. You can get to the people you could never access before. And you can help people who are not able to address traditional banking requirements to get loans at banking terms. The good advantage is ability of companies from the West to lend money in Africa and other regions that used to be underserved so that people can get out of poverty. That's powerful. And traditional question, are humans doomed? Is AI going to turn against us? Because that's the big question. I don't think so. First, there is no single AI entity. It's always a mix of humans, businesses, collaborators, and AI working together as a team. AI can be what you see and what you face, but it's always controlled by the people. It's always owned by someone. So what it does, it scales and empowers you in both good and bad. It helps you to make the right decisions or to make the wrong decisions. It's up to you. You have to use it right. And we can expect that the world going forward will get much richer and much better because you will get some really smart and specialized attacks against some really smart and good services that we couldn't imagine until yesterday. So thank you. Martin, yes. sorry, I was on the other <laughs> side. Oh, that was, really, that was really not nice for me. I'm very sorry. I didn't want to, you know, scare you off. You got behind me. Yeah, a little <laughs> bit over there. There is, there is a small, small chance to go over there. But you scared us a little bit, I would say. Where do you keep your money? Uh, in a bank. In a bank? And I only access a paper way how to use them. So okay. I don't trust any IT or any AI to keep an eye on my money. So the IT guy is saying, do not trust the IT. Uh, yes. Like, if you work in the security industry for a couple of years, you become paranoid. So being IT guy of our new startup is the worst job in the world. Well, that's a motivation, isn't it? Martin Rehag, thank you very much. Okay.